scriptures, and again, I keep repeating myself, I'm sorry every week for the new people. And it was studied by the greatest philosophers and people like Gandhi, it was his Bible. And many Western and German philosophers studied the Gita, and they used it as their Bible too. It is just about man's battle while man is alive on this earth. We have many battles to fight as human beings, and not because we want them, because by our karma, by life itself, battles come to us. So we get angry and we get frustrated. And here it's saying that this is the whole dialogue between the higher self, which is Lord Krishna, to Arjuna, who is like the disciple, the student. He doesn't really want to go into battle. And Lord Krishna, the higher self, is telling him, you have to, for the sake of righteousness. So because of the sake of righteousness, you go to war. But how do you go to battle? Paramahansa Yogananda says man's greatest victory is the battle over his or her mind, his or her mind. The greatest victory. So that's how hard it is to battle with our own minds. And this whole, whole book, which was written more than 5,000 years ago, is about man's battle with his lower nature, your nature. We've always battled with ourselves and this is the problems in our life. This is where all the problems come from. Our confusion, our fear, our anguish. What should we do? You know, do we, don't we? Do we, don't we? What's right? What's wrong? We never seem to be centered enough to make a balanced decision. Sometimes what seems wrong to somebody else is really right to you. In the Bhagavad Gita, it says in one of the latest chapters, what is one man's poison is another man's nectar. What is one man's nectar is another man's poison. But we are so scared to follow our nectar. We are so scared to know sometimes when things are poisonous, we will take the poisonous things just to please everybody else. So we get lost, we get very troubled, and we don't feel at peace with ourselves. We're not in equanimity, which means total balance. And so we make wrong decisions. Wrong decisions make us very uncomfortable, very unhappy. We can never find peace. And we keep stumbling again and again and again because we don't have the courage to live up to our own convictions, to our will, to what we know deep inside is right for us. We just don't have the courage. We're too scared. And the whole key to say, okay, first of all, you develop yourself. When you develop yourself and you understand that you are spirit, soul, and much higher than what you think you are, you are not the mind. The mind is an instrument that you can control. When you learn to do that and understand that, you can go into any battle and guess what? You are guaranteed success. You are guaranteed success because you're going into I'm sorry about that. There's just a little bit of a chair there because it'll keep banging. It doesn't go as far. Thank you. And so this is all our life, all of us. All of us have had so many battles, one after another. It seems as you get older, they get more different and more deep. And the reason is, is nobody's picking on us, it's just the way it is. And the sooner we understand them, the sooner we come to terms with why these battles have come to us, the sooner we stop blaming others and taking responsibility, the sooner we win the battle. Our problem is blame, blame, blame. We don't assume responsibility. You know, God is punishing. Why is this person doing that? And so long as we keep doing that, you will have no peace. Because really, battles and journeys come to us because we have to make a difference. We have to progress. We have to make the changes. Nobody can make changes for us. We, as human beings, resist. We resist. We fight. This is our battle. We fight the changes. We insist that somebody else has to change in order for us to be happy. 
And in our minds, we keep insisting and we keep struggling and we keep becoming unhappy. So the secret of the Gita is learn what is your highest self? What is the most truthful, the most honorable, the most dignified in you? And if you are following that voice that is truthful, working in honor, in dignity, even though the world may think it's wrong, but you are coming from a place of honor and good intention, then you need, then you need, and you can go through your battle, even though you fear it, and end up successful. So, last week, which one did we uh, start? Yes, start chapter two, two, 51. It's chapter 2, 51. Start and for those who are just starting today, it's on the internet. Shanti will tell you which channel or which, um, mm -hmm. website. which website it's on. It's on the internet and you can get um, you can get the last three weeks where I start from the very beginning and explain the background of the Gita and the background of the battle. And uh, I relate the Gita to our own lives. It's phenomenal. It's just a phenomenal text. So, um, page 25. That's Thank you. Sorry, my book is so old. <laughs> 50 did you say? 51. Enjoying equanimity of mind, renouncing the fruits of their actions, free of the bondage of rebirth, the wise undoubtedly go to a stainless state. Enjoying equanimity of mind. When you enjoy a balanced mind, how do you feel? How do you feel? Great. When your mind is balanced, you feel very peaceful and very clear. There's a lot of clarity in your mind when you're balanced. Huh? Renouncing the fruits of, the, of your actions. You see, whenever we embark on anything, there's so much expectation. There is so much expectation. If I go into this job, will this happen? Will that happen? Will that happen? And this expectation is what freezes you, what stops you from progressing. So here it's saying, if you're really wise and you understand that balance is the only way forward, then what will happen is, is you will not be attached to the results of your work. The moment you expect, you know, my master used to say, don't make an appointment, you will be disappointed. <laughs> and you'll say, of course, when I embark on anything in life, I have to expect some kind of result. I have to be ridiculous. Why would I embark on even a simple thing like building this home? There has to be an end result, right? And uh, yes, you expect an end result. But normally when you get an end result in anything, you have a goal because you have a dream, right? It's not wrong to have a dream. But many times, many of us have dreams in our lives or goals that we want to fulfill. But while getting to those goals, there will be many, many obstacles. Many obstacles. Now, those obstacles will seem so severe and so hard that you might just give up your dream and you might just give up your goal. And I've seen many people do that. They give up their dreams, they gave up their goals, because it's just too hard. They cannot deal with it. And that's because they're expecting something and they're not getting it. It's just too many obstacles. So here it says, when you're balanced, even when, even when these obstacles come, because you are not attached to the end result, you just know that's your goal. Full stop. You have no expectations. You just go ahead and do it. Do not expect anything. So anything I get is a bonus. When you do that, then you will enjoy peace. Try it in your life. So I'm going to these classes or I'm going to this uh, art school. And I'm not going to expect anything. All I'm going to do is enjoy the moment. I'm going to, uh, I'm going because I want the best for myself. And then when you go to the classes and let's say, you find that you're not learning anything, you'll just leave. And you find if you learn something, you'll stay. But most people feel very guilty. Oh, maybe if I leave, that's rude, that's this. That. Do you see? It's the fear. 
But when you don't expect a result, you're very clear about what you want. And you don't get emotional about it. It's the desire that makes it the expectation. Oh, I went to this class, and it wasn't what I expected. And then you get very, very disturbed. I didn't get what I want out of it. No. Because while you're there, you, all these thoughts will be running through your head. And there's no peace for somebody like that. So focusing, balance, and then you become wise. You will make the right decisions. You won't worry about your decisions. You won't have the emotional baggage. Difficult to achieve. When your understanding transcends delusion, then you are indifferent to things you hear about and things yet to be heard about. When your understanding transcends delusion, when your understanding, when you start to understand who you are and what you are, what you really are, then you will not be affected by what anybody says. That's basically what it's saying. You will not be affected. But if you are not strong in yourself and you're not convinced about the way you are living, there's confusion. Everybody will be telling you what to do. Right? And um, you'll hear about something and you go, oh, maybe I should do that. Somebody else will tell you something. Somebody else will tell you something. And I've seen this a lot with relationships. I remember I met this couple. We were going through a very, very difficult time. And the wife came to me and she said, she's done a lot of meditation and done a lot of work. And she said, you know, my husband is always depressed and I'm thinking of leaving him because the last I said, since when has he been depressed? And then she mentioned it was about two years. And and I said, what have you done about it? Oh, I just get so irritated and I've been speaking to so many other women and they've all left their partners and I'm just thinking I may do it too. And I said, before you make such a big decision and knowing your nature, I have to ask you a very simple question. Before the depression, were you very happy together? Which is two years ago, they've been together maybe 30 odd years. And she said, yes. So I said, I want you to go back and find out why the depression started. And we found out very quickly. She told me right away. I started, it's called Sorry. Yes. Can we close that door as well? Yes, it is cold. It's a little now, right? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I think he's trying to close it from the outside and block it, but now he's doing it. Quite a lot, this new job. 
And really, the depression started because her job was like 40 days. And during those 40 days, she would just, because she used to do trainings, right? So what she'd do is just come home, go out, I'm really busy, da da da, -da don't interfere with me. And so, of course, the nurturing that he needed wasn't there. So I said, why don't you try something? You're both just as spiritual. It seems such a pity, because it's hard to find another partner that thinks like you to start. Why don't you try what I used to do with my husband? He said, what do you do? And I said, well, at that time my husband was alive. So I said, what I used to do is work Monday to Thursday, hard, all day, with my patients, with people. And then Friday was my daughter's day. That time she wasn't married. And then Saturday and Sunday uh, was for my husband. And I would tell all my patients, please don't call me on Saturday and Sunday. That's the day for my marriage. So anyway, she went home and she spoke to him about it. And he was so joyful. Three years down the road, they travel everywhere together. They do everything together. What I'm saying is sometimes for her, what she was, you see, she was very solid, but when you are surrounded by people who tell you what you should do, after a while, no matter how strong you are, you weaken. You just weaken. But people like that are normally helped. People like that I have seen in my life will always go for help. I happen to come at the right time to tell her that, not because I came at the right time, nothing to do with me. Somebody, if I hadn't been there, somebody else would have come at the right time. And then you take the message or you don't. Hmm? Some people are so determined after they hear all their friends have left their partners, they just want to do it and they won't give it a chance. And so many times things that are not, shouldn't necessarily happen and cause pain happens because you listen to somebody else. Or the other case scenario, many times two people cannot live together. It's like a war zone. <laughs> the kids are affected, everybody is affected. And if we say, why don't they leave each other? But because of what everybody else stay, says, they stay. And for years, 30, 40 years, you know, I have one lady who came to me at the age of seven. Five, crying her eyes out. She hated her husband. I'm not even saying dislike. She hated him. And the language that was coming out of her mouth was foul. At 75 years old. And I said, why have you stayed with him for so long? She came from a generation where she couldn't live and she couldn't leave. Because everybody would talk. And it was her daughter who brought her to me and said, please tell my mom she's going to die without ever knowing happiness. She's never going to know. So I said, why don't you, her daughter said, why don't you leave me for a little while, get some peace. And so we talked to her, we did some visualization. And so she did go and stay with her daughter for a little for the first time in something like 50 or 40 years, she felt free. Well, obviously she couldn't go back after that. And, I, and the, because she was being screamed at every single day of her life, sworn at, he used to drink a lot, he used to break things when he used to drink. And that's what she did the whole of her life. And she stayed because she didn't have the courage to she was listening to everybody else. But everybody else's situation was not as severe as hers. That's why I said you never know. You just don't know. We cannot judge anyone because we don't know what happens behind closed doors. None of us know. Sometimes you may think this person looks so happy and then you find out they're so miserable. You just don't know. It's very hard to judge. And even harder to make a judgment on yourself if you are not balanced, if you are not sure, if you are not strong in yourself. Because already any decision you make in this category, especially with relationships, is going to come with a lot of guilt. And it comes
comes with a lot of guilt. So if you are strong, you can deal with the guilt and look at it as if you've transcended it and understand why you've gone into battle and then forgive yourself and forgive the person. And then you become free. And then your life becomes happy. So many people leave and they live with the anger and they live with the guilt. So what is the point of leaving somebody if you're still living with them in your mind? In fact, I had somebody who saw me many, many months ago and she said to me, uh, she had left her husband, I think it was one or two years later, and she came to see me. Every single sentence was about him. Every single sentence. I said to her, you've left him because you thought it made you happy. It's two years now. Why did you leave him? You're still just as unhappy. And worse still, your mind is obviously still attached to him. No, no, I can't go back to him. Then why do you get his approval for everything on the phone? Why do you have to keep calling him every day? Why do you keep getting upset about all this? If you really wanted to leave him, why are you keeping the umbilical cord? Why are you hurting him? Because he wants you back. Are you manipulating? What is going on in your mind? Are you taking revenge? Because now he's so upset that you've left him, that now you can hurt him back your own way. Every single thought is manipulating him, even when you're separated. You keep the thread going. I said, that's really cruel. No, I'm not going to go back to him. But he wants me back. Do you see? The manipulation, of course, I had to be very, very truthful. So it's really unkind what you're doing. That made her cry. And she admitted it was unkind. So do you want to leave him? Leave him. Because what was happening now? The children saw this back and forth, back and forth, and this same arguments that were going on and on at home happening daily on the phone. So the children had no peace. So this is the problem when you don't have a steady mind. And then what happens is you get a lot of karmic effects from this. Because every action brings a result. Every action, as you saw, you will read. So one has to be really careful about what kind of actions you put out. And if you're very truthful about them. In her case, very kind and nice on the outside, but really was total manipulation. She was not allowing him to be free by keeping that thread and constantly holding on to him. And here, I'm living with her, if she's always calling me every day, even though it's in an argument, because he didn't think it was so bad, she's going to come back. So she had to look at herself. And I said, you can do this. It's not up to me. It's your choice. You can manipulate him as much as you like. But you will come depressed over and over and over again. So if you want to lift yourself from depression, the only way out is to set each other free. And that is the truth about life. You know, like to tie each other up in knots. There's a lot of control. Hmm? We're very frightened to let go and trust ourselves. And trust that whatever has to be right for the other person, be right. But a lot of human beings just want to control. You know, I hear stories all the time about partners that have left each other. 22 years, 23 years, 24 years. Still angry. What a waste of a lifetime. It just makes me so sad. You've left the person, but have you really left the person? There's no freedom in your life. There's no joy. There's no laughter. What is the point of life if you can't have those things? We talk about spiritual energy. It's called Kundalini. It lives in the base of I mean, the, the, the uh, Easterners have a word for it. The Westerners call it Holy Spirit, the rising of the Holy Spirit. We call it Kundalini. And it lives in the base of your spine. And as you become more spiritual, then what happens is Kundalini should really, it's like a, um, it's like
like it's like a goddess that will give you everything you need. Why? Because as Kundalini rises in your body, it is an energy that comes from the divine. We call this energy the essence of this energy, truth, knowledge, bliss, absolute. In each of us lives this energy. A part of us that's connected to the divine, the universe. When we awaken that source, Kundalini will give us whatever we want. And the changes that we will come, and the changes that will come to pass in us will be feelings of joy, feelings of bliss, friendliness towards all, forgiveness, compassion. These things will naturally be awakened in you. And this is how you know your spiritual energy is being awakened in you. By your understanding, and here it's said very clearly, when you have the understanding that transcends what everybody else says. Because spiritual energy is on its own, its own vibrancy. If you're a poet, you will become a better poet. Why? Because when you're at peace and you're focused, how does your work turn out? Much better. And even if you're not at peace, but if your kundalini is arisen and you have solitude, and your solitude you will write wonderful things. It is just that the mind is sad, but the Kundalini will work with you. Spiritual energy will work with you. So any intense feeling will be magnified by your spiritual energy. Are you understanding this? This is why when I tell people when they start to meditate, try to keep your mind clean. Try and think good thoughts. Why? Because whatever you think when you stand to meditate, you will magnify. So if you're angry and depressed and you sit down and meditate and you're only thinking, oh, I'm so angry, I should have a quiet mind, I'm so angry, you are actually giving more power to the anger. Much more power. So meditation really does not help in those kind of cases. So many people have come to me and meditate so many years in peace. That's because the mind doesn't have peace. You haven't awakened the goodness that is the spiritual energy, the compassion that belongs to it, the joy. So Raj Yoga, or the science of yoga says, build these qualities up in yourself and Kundalini, the spiritual energy, will awaken by itself and it will grant you whatever you need. So in times of trouble, it will awaken and guide you. It is the goddess within. We call it Shakti, rising to Shiva. So this is all within ourselves. We are the temples of this great energy. And we should recognize this while we are alive. It's too late when we die. So the next uh, sloka. When your mind, which has been tossed about by conflicting opinions, becomes still and centered, in equilibrium, then you experience yoga. What is yoga? Sri Patanjali says, some of you know, yoga, shifta, vritti, naroda. When you restrain the thoughts that go on in your mind, what will you experience? You will experience who you really are, your true self, the peace, the quiet. And here it says, when your mind, which has been tossed about by conflicting opinions. And most of us live in that state most of the time. I know before I started yoga, it was constantly in conflict. And when you're in conflict, you have no peace and you're angry all the time. And then you have lots of desires and you blame a lot of people. These are the signs of inner conflict. And when you're in a conflict, you cannot experience yoga. You cannot experience your spiritual self. You cannot experience that right to be full of bliss. We call it ananda. <coughs> so here it says, when your mind has been tossed about by conflicting opinions, and it becomes 
become still and centered in balance, then you experience yoga. And Buddha often said, in fact, he always said, in order to have peace, you have to live in balance. My master often said, yoga cannot be experienced by one who eats too much or eats too little. Sleeps too much or sleeps too little. Anything in extreme cannot give you peace. So learn to balance your life. Not too much of anything, not too little of anything. Working. People do they overwork too many hours. Then there are those who underwork and are lazy. Both spectrums set are not happy. But the person who works hard and plays hard is the one that's happy. They, some many, many people, you know, to make money, they work from 8 in the morning till 12 at night, they have no quality of life. And the person who sits at home in front of a TV has no quality of life as well. So balance again keeps coming back to balance. So here, you see, uh, the higher self is telling Arjuna, or the God within is telling Arjuna, the disciple, understand what gives you peace. Understand what is the meaning of yoga. Everybody is telling you what you should be doing. Stop listening to all those voices. And start understanding that your own voice, when firmly established in wisdom, will give you the peace. Again and again. And I think this is why I love this line so much, because it's all self-transformation. It's not about transforming anybody else or changing anybody else. It's changing ourselves to be the best we can. It's transforming ourselves. And when you start, and you start meditating, and you start being joyful, you can see the world around you becomes like a bud, like a rose opening up beautifully in your life. Your life is much more beautiful, much more colorful. People of like mind will be attracted to you. Your friends will change. Your energy around you will change. Everything in your life will change when you practice the science. Getting into balance. Try it. You'll love it. So, um, Here is something I'd like to read to you that I uh, highlighted that my master wrote in his translation. When your intelligence is shaken by the conflicting opinions of others, don't get upset over it because you know the truth. Just accept their, their opinions as mere words. You simply feel Yes, that's what they feel. Let them feel that way. It may appear to be conflicting, but you give the freedom to others to think the way they want and say what they want. The enlightened person is not affected by that. And many times, you know, when people have been practicing yoga a long time, meditation a long time, building up their personality for a long time, you know, and they come to me and say, oh, I had this debate about your version, their version of God, and tell me, is it like this, or is it like that? I never go into debate. Don't debate. This is their opinion. This is what they know in this part, in this part of their lives. That's all they can see. And this is what you see. But by trying to debate with them, you're just going to get an argument. Because no matter how much you want them to see what you see, they won't see it because they haven't experienced it. If a person hasn't experienced something, why would they want it? Do you understand? And we spend half our lives trying to convince people of something that they don't want to be convinced about. And here Guru Dev is saying very, very simply, and so beautifully. Yeah, that's the way you believe. Fine. But I'm going to do what I like anyway. <laughs> you do that, do you? Good, good, good. I'm going to do what I want anyway. I do that all the time. <sighs> and even 
when I brought up my children, you know, sometimes when I would give them advice and they would say, Mom, we don't agree with you. I said, fine, I'm not here to convince you. Do what you like. You'll soon learn. And they used to hate it when I said, do what you like. Because they knew every time I said that, it would be trouble for them. <laughs> they used to shake. You know, I said, I'm not going to go into debate with you or argument. Do what you like. If you want to burn, you burn. I'm not giving you any more advice. Do it. Go. And um, they most of the time it worked. They never did. Because <laughs> you debate with them. The more you debate with young teenagers, the more they're going to do what they, you know, you're going to tell them, don't have the drums, they're going to have the drums. So you really want to try it? Should I find somebody? You really want to try it? And this is, I had this um, many years ago with a group of girls who were going to, to school in Comprehensive. Do you remember them? And there were six of them. And they came to see me. And they said, all of them crying and really upset. What's wrong? Melanie, we, um, you know, in school, there's so many pushes and they're all forcing us to try drugs. And we really, really want to. And we've decided, <laughs> we will. So I said, you've decided you will. Why are you coming to him? Why are you telling me? Because, look at this. We know we shouldn't. <laughs> so if you know you shouldn't, then why, why, why do you know you won't? Because all our friends have done it, and we're so confused. So I said, do you really, really want to try it then? Yes. Okay. I'm taking a risk here, I told them. I'm taking a real risk. I really don't have drugs. I used to work in a drug rehabilitation center when I was in university, and then I told them about five or six cases. And then after that, I said, but if you really want, I'll see what I can do. You try it with me, safely, as I'm putting myself into a lot of danger. Because if your parents found out, they'd kill me. But rather you be with me, safe, than I'm to school, unsafe. I'll see what I can do for you. I said, I don't know anybody, but um, you can tell one of your friends to come to me. And I was really scared. I was really scared because I didn't know whether it would work or not. It was one of my first cases, and there were five or six of these girls. I said, you go and think. Think. And you come back and tell me. The very next day after school, they came and said, no, me. we so appreciate that you're going to take the risk for us. We've decided we're going to be strong and say that. <laughs> so, wow, 10,000 our fathers, I think, that day. <laughs> Thank God, I did, you know? Because I gave my word, I would have kept it. I would have kept it. But I knew I had to help these girls. And if I had told them, no, don't do it, they would definitely go and do it. So they put me in a really difficult position. And I felt that they put me in that position, not because they put me in that position, because God trusted me to find the right solution. So, but I had no expectation for the results. I knew I could be in trouble. And I didn't know which way they were going to turn. And I was very grateful when they said they decided not to. And then they carried on to join all our yes. teenage yes. 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 And they told you the story. Yes. And, and they turned, you know, they stayed with us to be strong, to build themselves strong. And now they're all in university. And um, all doing extremely well. Some even going for masters, and yeah, and no drugs in their life. So it's it's um, giving sometimes people giving allowing them, like Guru does here, to make up their own mind. Allowing, oh, okay, this is what you think. I accept it, but this is what I also feel. And then if they disagree. No need to go into debate, we just think differently. And then by allowing them in the quiet time, they may actually hear what you're saying. But if you force it down their throats, they get, they'll start to rebel and they won't hear anything. And it's a good way. It's, I love this look because it's absolutely true in life. If you watch it, it works. 
And then here, Arjuna the disciple answers the Lord and he says, Oh Lord, what is the sign of one, of one steady wisdom who is always in Samadhi? How does this person talk, walk and sit? So now Arjuna is saying, but how would I recognize somebody who is in this wonderful state of peace? Samadhi means absorbed in the consciousness of your spirit. You know who you are. You know that you are soul and your spirit and the body is only temporary. Now somebody in Samadhi knows that all the time. Now how does this person walk, talk or sit? How do I recognize it? You know, tell me what are the signs? And he answers A person who has let go of all personal desires and is utterly content in the truth of the Atman, the true self, is one of steady wisdom. And here he says, When you meet somebody who is really content, and you know, uh, not always saying, I want this, I want to change this, this must happen, you know. We all meet these kind of people in our life. But one who's just happy, content, and totally understands, totally, that life is just a journey. That we're just here for a short amount of time. Don't take things so seriously. That is the one of steady wisdom. Knowing that this body is temporary and the soul and the spirit is eternal. And then he says, a person who is undisturbed by difficulties, who doesn't yearn to be happy, who has no favorites, no fear, no anger, is a sage of steady wisdom. You know, when difficulties come, you do not fear difficulties, you don't disturb. Oh my God, this is so difficult, am I going to do it? Am I going to do it? Oh my God, you know so many, again, so many of us, do that. And he says, when you're not disturbed by difficulties, okay, it's difficult. What can you do? You do not have the yearning to be happy because you know that life is full of pain and pleasure. You know, you actually know life is full of pain and pleasure. So because you know, you're already content. You don't have this, oh, I want to be happy. I want to be happy. I want to be happy. You don't yearn. You're already happy. You're already still, you already got the silence, you already know who you are. So you don't yearn, you don't yearn and hold on. Who has no favorites? What it means here is that you love all. You love all. You may be closer to all, but you love all. You realize that everyone is part of this dynamic power. So. No fear, no anger. That person is a sage of steady wisdom. No fear. That's a wonderful thing to be free of fear. Such a joy not to be fearful. And anger, any of you know that anger is awful, isn't it? It's a horrible disease. Horrible. I remember before starting you that was so Angry, so angry. And now I think, how should I ever live like that? How should I ever live like that? I no longer, for the last few years, ever experience that anger. I maybe once. And then that time when I was really, really angry, that one time in many years, was it about two or three years ago? I stayed up the whole night to pray. <laughs> Not that I was gone. <laughs> It was gone. And it's so nice to be able to release it, to recognize it, to see it, to work on it, and then to release it. And I pray for all those people who make me angry. <laughs> I really did. I don't pray for myself. Because I knew if I prayed for them, my, it's the only way to diffuse the situation by forgiving. And that, you know, because when somebody is so, has such a because it's expectation, you see. It's really not their fault. It's the expectation that somebody will be a certain way, and they're not. It's really one's person, and you know it. Then you know that you can work on the anger by forgiving. 
Okay, it's the only way. When you have anger, forgive. Nothing else works. So, and then it goes. Whoever is free of all mental attachments, who is not excited when good things happen, nor dejected when evil comes, is poised. Look at the word poised in wisdom. One who is free of all mental attachments. Now, mental, I love this word. Many times you're not attached to things. Many people will say, oh, uh, I'm not attached to this, and I'm not attached to that. Easy to say, but when it comes to the integrity, then mind is attached. Kind of like this story about this woman I told you. Don't want to be with my husband. But she's constantly with her husband in her mind. All the time, mental attachments. And how do you know when you don't have mental attachments? When your mind grasps, as Buddha would say, grasps onto something, and it keeps playing in your mind, you have mental attachments. See what it is that keeps playing the same thoughts in your mind. And then, work at it. Hmm? But if your mind, for example, something negative happens in your life, which will happen to everybody, even a saint, they watch it, they absorb it, and they let it go. Are you able to do that? Are you able to let it go? So that the mind doesn't eat you up. Hmm? That's mental attachments who is not excited when good things happen. Here it just means like, you know, high highs and low lows, or dejected when unhappy things happen. People who have high highs definitely get low lows. And I've noticed that people who get very excited about uh, things, very, very excitable, oh, da da this is happening to me, very soon they get very depressed. Very soon. And I'll give you myself as an example. Uh, in the old days, I used to do lots of choreography for fashion shows here in Marbella as well, were in high fashion. Before I started meditation, I used to be involved in choreography, dance at a dance school. And of course, I used to get, you know, when the show, I used to get so, so excited when we had the shows on. Our shows were always sold out, always sold out, very, very excited. Oh, it went so well. But the moment the show ended, Next day, all that adrenaline, all that excitement. I noticed that the next day, when it was all over, for no reason at all, I came to a very low, low. Because I got so used to working at that speed and that excitement over the last few months creating a show, and it was so successful. You get so high, so excited. I did this, and I really think you did it. At that time, I used to think I did it. <laughs> You get so high, and then when it's over, you collapse. And I remember uh, many years, I was still doing shows when I had started meditation, maybe four or five years later, uh, after meditating, and I was doing um, one of the biggest shows we ever did um, for Credit Suisse in Zagliata. When was it? Uh, Khashoggi's old house, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Huge fashion show from the floor, mm -hmm. from the world. I was doing all the choreography and all the clothes. And it was great, it was successful, it finished, and I felt nothing, just quiet. I wasn't used to that. I didn't even get very excited, and everybody said, good, yeah, 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 thank you, finish, good, and I said, well, let's go for dinner, I'm tired, I don't want all this attention. And then the next day, I didn't get the low, I didn't have the high, so I thought something's really wrong with me. So, <laughs> I don't know, calling my master, he was alive at the I said, does this meditation mean I'm going to turn dull <laughs> and bored with life? <laughs> How come I didn't get so high? I should have been the best day of my life and I didn't really care. And today I'm not low, but I'm worried. Am I going to become a really boring human being? And he started laughing. And he said to me, no, no. These are the first signs of letting go. These are the first signs. And of course, because you are not used to it, you think something's wrong with you. Wait. Three or four months later, you will love the feeling of peace. And true enough, three or four months later, 
it wasn't boring. I had more time to do more things that were more useful. I got into studying more. I could use my time more interestingly, you know? And um, that was a fabulous feeling. But it was a really nice feeling that when I got to understand it, that I wasn't so excited or disappointed. It's a wonderful feeling. It's quite freeing. Um, Mexico. How are we doing for time? Seven o'clock. Okay, so five more minutes, and then we'll have some questions, and I'd like to hear from you. When one can withdraw the senses from sense objects, like a tortoise draws within, his wisdom is unwavering. Now, this is a very, very famous sloka. These little stanzas that come in the Bhagavad Gita are called slokas. And this one has been, um, many wise people have quoted this, this particular sloka. When one can withdraw <coughs> from senses, their senses from sense objects, what does it mean? What are your senses? Anybody? What are your five senses? and smell. Correct. So, what is it that attracts us to things outside of us? Our senses, right? You smell something delicious. Mm. Suddenly, you're hungry. You may not have been hungry. Again, who was it yesterday at the table said to us when we were in Portugal? said, I'm never hungry until I see food. <laughs> and then I'm starving. <laughs> and I can eat so much. When well, you were at the table. It was the rain when you were Yeah, it was the rain when we went for dinner. Mm -hmm. The person said to me, I am. Uh, and I laughed, and I said, come, you know, you know, just when your senses start. He said, yes, it was Ole who said it, yes. Mm -hmm. He said, when I see, I'm fine, I can work for hours, and the moment I see food, I can't wait for the food to come. I'm so hungry, and I can eat so much, you know? And it's good that he can separate it. He's quite good at doing that. But once he sees it, it attracts it. And many of us are like that. We're fine. We're very happy. Our lives are very happy. And then suddenly, maybe a friend will come up and say, you know, I just got this new home, and I've lived in your heart, you've always wanted a new home. And then the unhappiness will come, the jealousies will come, the sorrows will come, right? Um, why? Because suddenly, that idea, not because you're jealous, not because of, it's just a train of events. The thought will come, oh, I really want that. Just because I talked about it, suddenly somebody really wants that. They go home. I want this. I want this. And becomes attached to the fact that I want a new home. Whereas it was per the person was perfectly free and happy before that. And they became disturbed. So here it's saying, when you can withdraw your senses, when these things happen to you, when somebody, oh, I've got a nice Mercedes. I really like that. <laughs> When you can like it and then let it go, then you know you are free. But if it plays in your mind and it makes you upset and it makes you sick, then you are caught. So learn like a tortoise when it's in when you see a turtle, when it's in danger, what does it do? Yes, it puts everything in, it's got a hard shell to protect it. Right? So when you find that your senses are going upwards. You know, people with addictions, this is a really good one. This is the one they use for people with, people with addictions. Take the senses inwards. And how do you take the senses inwards? You focus on your higher self. This is the first um, law of, I think, the Alcoholic Anonymous, AA. Okay. Yeah, do, does anybody know the first one by heart? Uh, says, look for the God within, or know there is a God, or something like that. That's the first law. And this is where it comes from. Take the senses. Don't look out. Bring it in. Who am I really? I'm the higher self. You don't need to be affected by that, just because they're happy yeah, I mean with them. But don't feel. If you feel you're going to cling to the material things, if you're worried about that, then quickly protect yourself. And start to think different things and say, you know, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed.
have this human existence. I have everything I need. I am content. You work on your higher self so that you don't get drawn by the, by the um, things outside of you. And then, when you're able to do this, whenever temptations come, or desires come, they come to torture your mind, because when you have a desire and you can't get it, it's quite torturous, have you noticed? <laughs> it can torture you when you, I really want, I really want, I really want to, you know? Many times I've had many people, <coughs> I really want a partner, I really want a partner, they can't breathe, they can't be happy unless they have a partner, and meanwhile their life is getting past them, they're not doing anything with their lives, because they're desperate to find a partner. So the more you, you, and then the more you, they try to grab, the more they try to look, the more it runs away. You go to their often said, I must often said, the more you chase something or run away, stay still and I'll come after you. <laughs> Be still and I'll come after you. If it's meant for you, it will definitely come for you. And um, so that's what that means. So you see, they're very ancient. The Bhagavad Gita is such an ancient scripture. And, it's, and yet, still applies to us today. You see, we as human beings have never really changed. What has changed is all the technology around us. Circumstances. We're much more comfortable with nice homes, cars, much more mobile. We can travel the world. With all those things, we have not learned to be happy. So what's the point of having these wonderful things if we can't be happy? It seems like such a waste of life. We were born to be happy. We were born to enjoy everything we have, not to fear it. And yet also on this retreat, somebody was telling me, um, uh, oh, my hostess, tell me my hostess. Oh, Ula, she's Swedish. She lives in Estonia. She's just wonderful. Hopefully, she's coming in March with a group of people. I hope you'll meet phenomenal group of people like you guys, you know? And uh, she went, Ula, Ula, I love to come to your house for these talks, you know? Uh, we have 45 people. Her house, is, busy. her house was small, so she announced. Uh, she said, Listen, next time, do you want me to get a hall? How many would like me to get a hall so you won't have to be so squashed? I can hire out a hall instead. And the first day when I get the talk, one person. The second day, nobody. <laughs> the reason being is that her house was so comfortable because she made it so home. And I remember one person, I was just standing there, and she said, Una, you know, your home is so lovely. Because you've been doing this house, and you have too, right? Last year. By the way, she sends me a lot. And um, so I feel so comfortable here. I'm not scared. I'm not sad. I go to some people's houses and have to sit like this because I'm so frightened of spoiling anything or dropping something because they're so attached to their homes. So, but only you just move your chairs and you give us all tea. Thank you. 